So we have uh, our very dear friend Andy Broad is going to be walking through Sketchblock, which is software that he wrote for Mega OS 4. Um, Andy is a very good developer. He spent a lot of time on this project. It's a labor of love. If you're interested in understanding how Sketchblock works uh, and seeing the master at play, uh, <laughs> then I recommend coming in and uh, checking out the uh, checking out the seminar. So, Andy, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, I'll give them a couple more minutes to walk in since there's only a couple in. So. Yeah, I know. Raffle, yeah. Because <laughs> well, in particular, I thought uh, Ken Lester was interested, so calling Ken Lester. <laughs> right, okay. Um, it's a La Paz uh, brand, but it's a UC Logic chipset. Um, which um, comes on the brand Wizard Pen, uh, a few others. Um, there's a dri I wrote the driver for it, it's on OS4 Depot. It's, it's a fairly simple one, it's just, just got um, sensitive no, no tilt or anything like that. No, I hadn't either, but uh, I found it dirt cheap in, in, in the computer store, so I bought it and sketched, find, found a driver for it online and converted it, yeah. Okay then, um, thanks for coming along for this demo. Um, I'm going to show you a, a few of the features of Sketchblock. Um, it's gone through quite a few iterations, so I'm going to talk about it in general rather than trying to think about what's new, because um, some of you may not have seen it from at all, so it's going to work from that. One of the things, if you've seen it before, brand new icon, which um, Kevin Saunders did for me, and one of the first things I'm going to mention, which is a new feature, is it's now themable, so we're going to start it up. It's running now with, with the, um, the old theme, which um, uh, Martin Mason created for me, with, with the um, ARSS icons, plus a few special ones like these selection gadgets. Um, so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is going to convert it to the new theme. So I open up the um, settings and the edit window, and promptly find that I haven't got ProAction running, so just fix that. I haven't installed it. I didn't install it with me. I don't see this thing. It's already fabulous shell there for you. <laughs> okay, yeah, right, go into the settings menu, which comes up nicely. Um, there's a new, a new entry, theme name. Um, we're going to change from the ARSS theme to the K 
AS speak for Kevin Saunders. I think that's spelled right. I can't quite see the text. Save the preferences. It does require a restart, so I stop the program. Start again. Uh, that didn't work. gadgets you need to press enter in sometimes and it's almost not always obvious. Um, yeah, right, now you can see it's a new theme because um, because the logo is different and some of the gadgets have changed. Um, but the themes that I've provided for these two things, they come in two parts because um, in order to get um, a change of tick marks and such like, you need um, separate graphics press. So what I'm going to do now is stop again and open up Screens press. Uh, press. And I'm going to enable the um, sketch block print window that I've got waiting. And then use a custom um, GUI press. Which now um, go to um, sketch block. A sign. This is a little fiddly and technical, but I don't think there's any easy way to um, to, to automate this section at, at the moment. Um, um, no, because I'm not running the program. Can't get the start. Right, now it's the sign. Themes and choose the going to the KS presets to GI press. Then going to the palette, to the custom, to the custom file. And same again. Go to sketch path. Scheme and also the new gadget style. So you can get, you can only use the full theme on your own screen unless you choose to change the um, the workbench theme to that scheme if you like it. Enough. But um, it's just designed for Sketchbot really. So so we're into the main program. Um, the default layout is still set up for a um, one to eighty screen. So the first thing I ever do is now is move that over here and drag this out to full size. Now, big contribution from Kevin Saunders is a hundred new brushes, just the same as he did for the pea paint. But this must have taken a lot more work because these are a lot bigger. A um, hundred different themed brushes. Um, they're quite big brushes. Um, 
So we've got a range of different effects, different sizes and shapes and things going on there. Oh, the colour's on, I haven't clicked the colour. Yeah, it's a nice effect, but um, uh, I was going to demonstrate that later, so I confused myself. <laughs> so you can see there's some great brushes here. This is a, a fractal, um, kind of spiral fractal thing. Um, um, so let's change the colour so you can see the contrast. So there's some pretty cool brushes. Um, they're all a little big. Um, on, on the next 1000, they flow quite well, but on a, on a slightly lighter machine, they may be a, bit, a little slow. But you can um, use the brush presets to set them to a smaller size, so scale them down to say 50%. Um, so now it renders that slightly smoother, and then at 50%, they, they, there's no lag at all in that. Go straight across and drawing freehand. Um, and Sketchblock is designed for freehand drawing, so the most optimized part of the program is, is, is being able to draw freehand without, so that brush draw is always in the single of the mouse, because otherwise it drives you mad. Anybody who knows who's done drawing in a uh, program knows if, if you start there and, the, and it catches up a minute later, then you just give up. Um, so, fantastic selection of new brushes, which is one of the major contributions to 2.7, which is going into the Radiance package and also as a standalone. Um, so features, what we can, what we can do is, it's a layers based program, so we've got all this on one layer, we can add a new layer, which uh, default is white, so it overwrites, um, so we can now draw something else, Let's switch back to a smaller brush, just um, for sketch. Now layers um, are, are blended together. Um, by a number of different rules. Um, by standard is the simple opacity, so you can just turn down, so you can see the layer below it through it, obviously. Um, but also there's um, a whole set of um, multiply, so it interacts, it multiplies the colours together. Um, you've got divide, so um, uh, these are a lot. These are fairly standard modes, so you can get different effects. So add works well, like a um, almost like a palette, and you can use it to, uh, what's called it, um, you can see that, yeah, um, in this context, I'm subtract. So depending on the different colours you've got, you can get some totally amazing effects just by doing this, and you can work the paints through. And of course, you can use the opacity to vary the amount of that as well. You get some um, quite interesting combinations. It depends on what you want to do, um, but the most common two I use is the simple normal alpha blend and the multiply, because. Um, uh, uh, but you've also got saturation; you can turn things black and white, except for where you draw, or all the other way around, depending on the color scheme. If, you, if you're drawing in black, where it's white, it desaturates; where it's coloured, it goes to the. Um, the level of saturation of the colour you're painting in. So you can, um, these are probably quite complicated terms for beginners, but um, when you play around them for a while, um, you get um, interesting effects. So it's been darkened. Um, layers can, let's go back to the normal. So that's a normal solid layer. You can also um, have alpha blending on the layers. So I can add an alpha channel, which just adding the alpha channel um, which shows up here now as an icon. Now, now shows that you have alpha. The little X disappears. It's hard to see. There's, there's an X saying there's no alpha there. There's no, there's no X, so you have an alpha channel on this, on this one. So you can erase the alpha channel. Just simply rub it away, so you can see what's below it. Or you can add, use one of these functions. Add, turn the colour to alpha. So this will turn the background colour, which is white, to transparent. So now you can see through. And then of course you can paint into that. Open spot. And if I move that there around, you can see 
that the two are independent. Which, um, which this is, I mean, the, a lot of the Amiga programs are starting to use layers. I think one or two of them do. Um, like, I should imagine, um, what's it, is it not Photoshop? What's it? Photo, Photo, there's one beginning with P. Yeah, there's a couple of names there, but I don't find anything that's Yeah, okay, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, I can't, I can't remember the names of the other programs, but some. Um, yeah, that's the one. Yes, yeah, so actually, yeah, Image Space does use layers, but it's a very, it's a very different way of doing it. Um, one, one feature that in Sketchblock, which I think is pretty unique, is the way the undo works. Um, normally, uh, in a paint program, you undo step by step. So if you add something to one layer and then you add something to another layer, and then you want to undo what you added to the first layer, you have to undo. The subsequent steps, um, and I found a few times that I'd drawn exactly what I wanted in, in one place, um, changed changed it, drawn something else on another layer, realised that I wanted to go back to the first thing on the first layer, and you have to undo the whole lot and then go back again. So, so now undoing works on a per layer basis. So, um, you click that, undoes all the movements. But um, then if I change back to this there, I can undo the last thing I did to that there, independently. Uh, or we can redo it again. And I find so, I find that gets a lot more flexibility in um, how you handle um, sort of non-destructive editing. You can do a whole lot of work on one, one layer, switch to another layer, do a load of work, and you can undo the previous work if you decide it doesn't quite fit together. Um, up at the top here is a master undo, and this um, works through the different undo steps in order. So if you want just to undo it in the normal way, um, step by step you can. And this also group certain scripts group small steps of undo together. So if you do a scale operation, that might shrink the window and then move it to a different position, which will be two steps on, uh, at the program level. Uh, the master undo will undo that whole grouped operation, or you can undo sections of it on the sub sub levels. On the, there's a project level undo layer, and an individual undo for each layer, and some hidden ones that I, thought I decided were too complicated for putting into the GUI for normal users, so to speak. But it can be accessed from the Arex interface. So um, it's getting a bit messy now. So let's get rid of some. Rid of some the new icons, I think, uh, I've had a few complaints, um, I mean, it's too strong, some feedback, but um, it's hard to work out what these icons do in the AISS version because they're very, very, very similar. So Kevin tried to make them very distinct. So we've got add new layer, um, move the current layer to the background. I think that's the reason we said move it down to the bottom. So I was already in the background, I still still aware of So move it down to the bottom. Um, didn't seem to make any changes in their mind. Um, oh no, that was copyless. Sorry, I'm losing the problem here a little bit. The trouble is they're, they're much more distinct when you've got a focused screen, but when you're at the other end of the room and you can't even see where they are. <laughs> right, so that one copies the layer. Um, that one moves the current layer to the top. That one moves the current layers to the bottom, and that one mer merges the two current layers together. So um, current that merges the current layer with the one below it. So if I come to this one here, now this one will get merged into that one. Um, so, and this one uh, deletes the there completely. So I go to the bottom one, I can delete that one. And that one. Can you resize the layer areas? Can I? Layer, make, give you more growth, um, resize the yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was so busy showing off the. Um, yeah, you can drag that up and down in the middle. Um, you obviously see a little preview in the layer. That can't be set at the moment. I'm thinking of maybe making that one um, an option so the size of that can be reduced or even removed if you don't want to put it. And then you'll be able to see a lot more layer information if you need it. Uh, this icon turns the layer on and off so you can see it or not. So anyway, let's get rid of these layers and start from scratch. Um, right, some other functions. 
Um, as well as freehand drawing, um, we support text um, and vector paths, which are text is converted into paths, so it's a very similar aspect. So um, go to the layers menu and can't see, create text option. Uh, got a little ProAction GUI comes up, so it's a, this is a script running with my ProAction server, and the your normal user didn't need to know that, but um, just for the technical aspect, it kind of runs, it's basically an Arrow script, creates a, creates a GUI, and you can um, do all sorts of things from it. This one creates text, so we've got text in the middle there. Um, using the text gadget, you can put whatever you like, set the justification, um, I'll get into that, type in some text. Um, we've got some controls for the height and the baseline. The height um, defines the, the height of the text, which we've probably made down about 50. And the baseline is the separation of the lines, basically. Um, and you can choose a font. And basically, you directly choose uh, any, any true type or postscript font. Um, I think there may be a few other types, but mainly it's true type or postscript are the ones we have available. And it's using um, free type to load the, load the fonts. But there's none of this um, font, config, com, font config stuff up a program support from. Uh, you just use them directly. So if I choose, uh, what I've got there. there's not a lot on this, this particular program, so it's fairly boring. So I just choose a Vera font. I've got, and um, make text. And creates smooth anti-ABS text which you can move around. You can't edit edit the text. You can see my typo skills coming out there. Now that I can actually see what I typed. <laughs> um, so that's not editable, unfortunately, at the moment. But, um, but the GI does store what you last did. So if I bring it up, um, create text again. The last, the last set of options you have are in, are in there, so you can go in and fix some of those typos. Yeah, everything should be safe, so we make that a little bit bigger. Not at the moment, but that's not impossible. Um, that would be slow, though, because um, I'd have to be accessing all those t true type fonts with font with free type and rendering them off and stuff. So um, you might wish I didn't by the time you. <laughs> it, it probably makes more sense to do that with the OS gadget. Yeah, um, I'm not using the OS to load the fonts because I need. Um, the, the, the OS API doesn't give you access to the actual metrics of the font. Um, it will render the font for you, but I need it, um, the actual positions of the dots and the vectors and such like. Because um, what this does is it creates um, a path from the fonts. And I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a quick demonstration of the paths in a minute, but, um, which is why you get such smooth anti aliasing, which you can't see so well. Um, This, but if I, if I zoom in, maybe it might show up a little bit better. The, the resolution of the screen is a little bit um, fuzzy. Now, this, I don't know if you've used Sketchblock before, but you might notice that the scrolling is now dead smooth. Um, up until last week, it was absolutely abysmal, uh, almost an embarrassment to be honest, because I had to render everything on the screen for every little touch, but I've now done a proper. Um, damage areas and such like, so I really render the edges as I scroll and use scroll raster to properly do it, do it the proper Amiga way. So, so coming back onto the topic, you can see that you've got a very good smooth anti-aliasing on that text. 
I don't think you can get much better um, unless you make it a bit softer, perhaps, I don't know, but that's, I like that's pretty good. So you can put pretty much arbitrary text in there. Um, editable text is um, on the to-do to to list. So um, I zoomed it from the zoom gadget at the bottom there, but you can also um, use the shortcut in the menu. Um, and there's a fit to window option, which is the fastest way to get back to normal. Um, a little trick that I use actually when I'm using a stylus, which I'm doing at the moment, it's really hard to access the right mouse button. So I simply use the right and Minga Alt combination to bring up menus uh, with, with my left hand whilst working with the first right hand. So it can be sketching away like this here and then bring up the menu when I need it um, to bring up, say, the image resize, which has got um, simply half the size of the image. That will now that, that's an example of the, um, the composite undo that I was talking about. That was done in a set of set, separate operations, which you could use the master undo to undo the whole lot. Or you can undo it on a per layer basis. Well, that, that was a project resize or, the le or one operation per option. Should you ever need just, just to undo one section of it. So, it's a complicated concept to get your head around, but I think it's really powerful once you know how to use it. Right, that's text. Uh, another thing I was going to show is um, is path. Path. So I'm going to load in um, a new project. What I'm doing here is I'm going to directly import um, a reference image from the. Next, so get a demo references. So now zoom it to fit the window. Ah, oh, this is a nice lizard image I found. Now I'm going to load in a work in progress because this takes quite a while to do. Um, so I load in a path. Well, a path is basically a collection of, of splines, which are curves and points, and can also have um, simple polygons as well. Um, I'm going to add some more different types of sub-elements to that over time. But, um, uh, I think that's the right one. Does that come up? Right, so I loaded the path. Um, this area of the GUI needs a little bit of um, tweaking because you can't actually see that you've loaded anything there. But if I go into Edit Path, uh, it will now come to active, and you can see all the points um, on around the out, outline of, of the lizard. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit now. So. Um, because I zoomed in, and I, as I say, the GUI needs some work, uh, they've been overwritten. So a little trick there, when that happens, if you find they disappear, just call the edit path um, script again, and they reappear. So as you can see, there's a control point there. That's going to be a bit tricky, because I can't see that. Right, I've selected it, and you can drag it around. So what I'm doing with this project is gradually creating an outline. I've got down to here somewhere, I can't quite see. Um, yeah, I'm going to use that edit path trick again, because I really can't see what's going on there. Okay, so you can create outlines. So to create a new path, you press shift and control. That's a new, a new path, and there's a dot there. Now to create a new dot on that, you press um, I'm clicking with the um, with the stylus and pressing the control key, and then another one, uh, and then you can move backwards with the keyboard, um, and then convert that point there into into a control point rather than rather than a point. So that points an outline there, and then I can move to the next toe and create 
another path, add another line, um, same again. So you can um, build up a little outline as you go of the, um, oops, so now I need to delete that part if it's delete, which is very easily. I've done it again. Press shift and then I think this is a neat little feature that you can build gradually build up. So now if I'm gonna add another layer now in plain white over the top, and now what I can do is go to the path menu again and stroke the path with the current brush. And you've instantly got an outlined picture. Um, you can save that path out and you can use it to um, create vector graphics from it. Now, it's, this is um, it's a set of tools for somebody who's got an interest to build something more. And somebody's asked me about CAD the other day, which I think is a bit ambitious, but you could use this, this set of tools if you were an Arix programmer to write a CAD program running in Sketchblock. And one of the principles of Sketchblock is that it's, um, it's an API for painting with. Um, you don't have to use the GUI that I've designed for it. If you have the skills, you can write your own plugins in, in Python and Arix um, to do more advanced things. Um, so now we can we could make this one transparent so it overlays the original, and you see so good map. Yeah. It's one path. Um, within the sketch on this definition, a path is a collection of splines, so or objects and points. So they're all <coughs> they're all grouped into one one big path. And, and when you're drawing the points, um, some of those lines are some of them are connected to the same spline. Yeah. Some are. What was the switch between the connected? Um, to create a new a new spline, you press Shift and Control. Create a new point. You press just press control. Yeah. And uh, any point that you add will be added to the current active spline. That's it. Yeah. There's there is some there is some documentation on the website about this, but some. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you're not going to remember when you go home in a minute or when a couple of days is done. Yeah. So. And then a few other tools like left and right mouse moves backwards and forwards within the path. Um, And then just clicking, near the nearest point will be selected. Or if you shift click, the nearest path um, curve will be selected. I don't know if you can see that one here because of the colours are hard to see. The selected one turns um, turns red, but I'm not sure if you can really see the difference in colour between red and black. I mean, that's black, and that's red. It doesn't show up very well on this screen. And, and you only have like one half file per layer. No, paths, paths are global to the project. Uh, you can load as many as you like, but there's no real way to see what's loaded at the moment. This is one of the areas I need to expand. I mean, there's, there's a lot in Sketchbot, but there's a lot to do yet. And um, I'm going to put a lot of work into uh, the 3.0 version, which will be coming out when it comes out. Um, Sketchblock is a high dynamic range program, so that means um, rather than the first two bits per image, you've got a whole floating point value for each each color channel, red, green, blue, alpha, which gives you amazing flexibility for shading and such like. But it means it uses a lot of memory. And all some people want to do is scale an image. So the next generation of Sketchblock will give you the choice. Um, the first generation used 32, then I thought I'm, I'm upgrading to a high dynamic range. Now I'm going to upgrade to choice. I think the choice is good. So if, if you just want big, uh, not too worried about sub detail, then you can use 32-bit. If you want really fine shading, um, then you can choose to use a high dynamic range. And if I can get it to work, uh, you'll even be able to have combinations within one, one project. That just depends on how they interact, um, how much that might slow things down if I have to do too much conversion. So, so one, one comment on the HDR feed. So you're gonna, I think there's an HDR format. I don't know how common that is. So uh, well, I, I have built all the um, the support libraries for the EXR format as part of Blender. 
Um, so I will, I will work on a way to import that data because there's no way at the moment to save the HDR data apart from a native <coughs> sketchbook file, uh, which is great for sketchbook. If you want, if you actually want to port out and export an HDR image, then um, then I need to build an exporter for that. Um, but I have already got all that stuff as part of the Blender port. So I need to work out how to in build a plugin that doesn't mess up the GPL status of my app, which isn't, and that is. So you know what it gets like with mixing. Might have to get somebody else to write it for me. <laughs> uh, data types wouldn't be able to handle the data once you loaded it. There's, there's, unless you, you don't, a picture data type couldn't deal with HD at the moment. We'd have to rewrite the picture data type for that. I don't plan to doing that. So it would require like a standalone viewer to view the... Yeah, there is one on OS4 Depot actually. Okay. Right. Um, if you want to check that out. I ported that a long time ago. It's, I think it's called the EXR view or something like that. So if, if people are creating work with Sketchblock and they want to show it on their Vega, they would use that viewer to their open files using, if they're using the higher penetration. Yeah. Uh, once, once I've written a tool for export, maybe I might have a look at that tool and see if I can um, uh, find a way to import sketch block images into that direct. I haven't really thought of that, but that's, that could be another sub project. Um, right, what have I covered? Text, paths, layers. Can I, I'll just take questions and see if anybody wants. Uh, yes, in a sense you can. In so far as. It's got PostScript print support, so you can print to PostScript and set up as a page. You can set up a print to EPS, so the whole image goes out as an EPS file, or you can print to PDF. Again, you have to set up the page. Um, let's see if I can. Uh, hang on. Uh, I need to get. No, it's not for action. This one. Yeah, I just need to get rid of that because there's no PostScript device on this, and just want to save to RAM. So let's see if we demonstrate this. I've oh got what's going on here. Can't see the cursor. All right. So if I, if this has been worked properly, that should be printed into PDF now. It prints what you can see on the screen uh, in that mode. I think you, yeah. So right, I should in the RAM disk now have a PDF which should load up, and there you go. So you could create that PDF from your from your image and take it down the printers or or print it using whatever technique you can use to print it. Print PDFs like Ghost Script or. Whether. But I, I don't directly support printed device because um, that's you throw most of your image college away when you do that anyway. So you might as well use um, existing support. So pretty much anything that Andy needs to do to get the image to the publisher, whereas CD covers is it schedule. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, but, it's dri it is driven by my needs, basically. If I find something I can't do, I implement it. Um, if people ask me for features and they're, and they're reasonable, I do that too, but I don't know what people, other people need until they ask me for it. So if you've got a feature, in, if you use Sketchblock and you need something, tell me and it will go on the to-do list. Um, can't guarantee it will be done tomorrow, um, but if it's a simple one, I'd do it quickly. If it's not, um, well, I'd keep it all in mind. Can you, can you show us HDR? Can you actually show us like an image where you can see that high dynamic range like, do you have anything local or can you whip up a color? All I can really show is how it how it checks the smoothness of um, of scale of um, fill. I'll show you the um, the gradient fill and put a box in the color in there and apply that gradient. Get a really smooth color gradient there. Um, in 32 bit, you'd, you'd get banding on that, even on 32. 16 bit type images, you get loads, but I thought. Yep. Yeah. That's 
question about your, uh, your slider routine. Yeah. <laughs> See, I mean, that's a pretty smooth gradient. Um, in terms of, because a lot of people associate high dynamic, high dynamic range with the compressed images that you see. Um, you can't really do that yet with this. You need to actually build that up yourself. There isn't, doesn't, I haven't got any compression tools yet. That's something I might look at creating. Because I know there's, there's, there's some interest in that. Because um, I know you asked about it, didn't you? And um, about porting a set of tools. Was it you that asked about that? You asked about porting a set of um, um, dynamic, high dynamic range compression tools of some kind. I can't remember. And I, bla I, I bragged that you can do that already in Sketchblock, but but it's not quite true because you have to you have to do it yourself by hand. Yeah, there's a Q, there's a uh, QT project called Luminance HDR. Yeah. And it's for taking multiple regular photographs and squashing them into uh, an HDR yeah. image, and then you told me that I could do it with Sketchblock. You can. So I took my 12 megabytes. If I had, I haven't got a sample of um, images at different um, so things to show, but what you can do is build up four or five layers. And, and then change the way those layers are mixed together to get that effect. You definitely can do that um, using the multiply effect and the past and such like. You can save that whole project as a whole thing from the save option. Uh, just, and I normally put them in sketches and just save. Or I'm not going to do save that one now. Uh, or you can use export, in which case, hang on, export as, which should bring up another little um, GUI, and you can select the format, the JPEG save, export to RAM. No, um, import, import files are, are data types based. Uh, exporting is, is handled by um, uh, PIL, which is the Python Imaging Library. Um, so all the data types that Python Imaging Library can load, you can load, you can save, you can um, save via um, via the script, which is a, a few really weird ones. Um, which are suitable for geographic satellite analy analysis and, and a couple of useful ones like JPEG ping and, um, and TIFF and such like. Um, I think one of the projects I'm going to work on for the 3.9 version will be dedicated um, loader and saver modules because um, PIL is useful but it is a little slow and I think having, and you don't get so many access options. To have a, a JPEG saver where you can set the percentage quality and all that kind of thing would be very useful. At the moment, it just saves as much. In order not to lose any quality, it saves maximum quality. If you want to shrink that, then you'd have to load it into image effects, perhaps, and fiddle with the with the um, compression qualities and such like. Any more questions? Yep. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got a bunch of those. Bunch. A load of those. Okay, right, this row here, uh, I can't quite see that properly. Right, you've got four tools um, rectangle select, which you can just grab that, press the space bar, and that selects your rectangle. This is a bit that quite a few people miss. Um, when you with this rectangle and ellipse tool, you have to press the space bar to make the selection good. Moving the, um, the guide around just chooses a different position, but you don't change the selection until you press that space bar. Um, so that's been confusing a few people. I can't find any easy way of, apart from maybe right clicking, but that's a really awkward with the um, stylus, uh, other than actually having a, a separate key action to do that. So the, the concept is preview of yeah, basically. And now you've got a set of um, options. You've got the replace option, add option. So if you add and then you move up there, and then you grab again, that adds the two selections together. 
Um, you've got the subtract option, which is already on. So that now that selects that. So you've got an area selected. You can do the same thing with the ellipse tool. Let's say um, subtract a little bit of an ellipse there. So what the, what the selection tools do, um, a lot of people think of them as copy and paste, but it's not really about that. It's, it's a, a mask. It's a painting mask. So operations now, when you grab a brush and to the complementary colors, you can see it. You just and paint into that layer. They only occur inside that selected area. Let's get the size and on there. Like, can you start convert selection to a path? Um, yes, there is an experimental function hidden in the Arix interface to do that, but it doesn't work very well. Okay. It's incredibly. Di I mean, that is really easy. That's square square lines. Really easy to work out where the corners are, and you get a, you'll get a square path from that. But if you were to do use this function, which is the flood select. Let's turn that back to replace and try and focus that eye. Um, okay, that went a bit odd, but. Um, uh, yeah, of course, yeah. We can't really see it, but it's like. So let's get rid of that, yeah. Go into the original thing. So I've tried selecting the eye there, so, or I need to make the color so it's a little bit less. So let's try and select his nose. Okay, so because it's a photograph, this kind of thing doesn't work as well in photographs as it can be. Right, so you, right. Now imagine trying to make a path out of that with, with, with code, with, by hand, let alone with code, is a headache. Um, the, the, I, didn't, I haven't actually read the code in GIMP, I just looked at the size of the file and bought right. Because <laughs> I don't want to read GIMP's code too closely because that I mean, contaminates, doesn't it? But, um, so it, there is an algorithm to do what you asked for, but it's really bad at doing it. Um, you, having said it's not about co copy and paste, that there is a script to enable you to, to um, copy the selection, which um, uses some sub, sub layers and things. Now, if that works right, I should have the um, selection in the, key, in the um, clipboard, and I should be able to paste that into a new layer. So there's a new there now. Um, up the top there's to turn the old ones off. So what did you, what does the copy do? It's just the selection. Yeah. Okay. You, like in Photoshop, there's a tool when you have a selection, you can move stuff around. No, you can't, you can't pick, pick up stuff now. You can just um, copy data out. Oh, it's up the top there. There it is. There's the, um, the set of, Images that I just copied out of that layer. So that, that, that operation cut the image data yeah. and turned it into another layer that's. Uh, yeah, it turns, it, into an, turns it into another layer, and, uh, which you can then position where you can move that around. And position where you want. That's, that's a bit of a pale example, unfortunately. Yeah. But that is now actually in the um, system clipboard. So if I. Um, if I uh, let's find a, I just, no, uh, where's my original, oh there it is, if I bring up my selection and then do a control C to, a control V to put the clipboard in, uh, oh it's even still pale on there, but you can see at the top there, there's the image in the system clipboard, so you can share that image um, with, uh, with uh, other, Systems. So let's get this back over here. If you were to paste that into an app that had alpha channel support, would that be alpha channel? Yeah, it would be, yeah. Let's just do this again with a slightly more obvious um, paint tool in first. Let's get that one visible, turn that one off. Things are 
bouncing around over here. So right, if I paint into that layer, should be painting. Can't see. Uh, I think this is a bit pretty. Um, oh no, the selection's still on. Right. Oh yeah, if you need to clear the selection for some reason. Um, you can just put it clear and it should go away. Clear the selection. So now the selection's gone, so you can draw again. Hello, or not, as the case may be. Uh, okay, I really can't see what's going on in this at the moment, to be honest. It's just uh, this too blurry on the screen level. Oh, it is painting, it's just that really soft brush. Let's get that one back. Um, oh, it's on the other uh, channel now. Right, okay. <laughs> Still, and I've got colours the wrong way around. So here we go. Right, now, and I'll do a colour select on that one, a flood select on it. This will be a lot more obvious. Now I can copy that into the clipboard. Copy selection. Let's turn this layer off. So that layer off, rather. Now, if I paste that, you'll be, it'll be a lot more obvious that it's happened. So you can see the, the selected area with the upper channel that has, has been saved. And um, again, if I um, show you there and do a control V, it's in, it's in the system clipboard with alpha channel. So if Okay, um, keyboard equivalents, um, firstly the way to find out what they are uh, is to go to settings, edit and choose keys. So there's a whole list. Now that's a little bit cryptic because it's a list um, of keys and the list of commands associated with keys rather than name. But, uh, yeah, that's as it's default. So the standard ones I've got at the moment are P for paint, E for erase, S to swap the colours. Um, that swaps these two colours backwards and forwards. Um, control Z is a global undo, Control Y is a global redo. Um, Amiga Z and, and Amiga Y also work, I believe, but um, Control Z is very convenient when you're painting one handed. Um, I think, uh, so, and there's a few others there, so I'll just show you by hand the ones I can remember. So, P is paint, let's just clear this out and get a new, new layer. So, and then clear the, clear the selection. Right, P is paint, E is raise. All right, this is a subtlety of arrays. When, when there's no alpha channel, when there's an alpha channel, it erases it completely. So if I put an alpha channel on that layer, add alpha, now you're erasing. So as I said, P is paint, E erase. C uses a new, new color picker tool. There's always been a color picker tool in um, Sketchblock. Um, but you press the control to activate it. This, this brings up a more complex tool um, where you can do um, averaging picking. So you can pick the average between those, those at that point uh, over about four or five pixels. You can make it a bit bigger and then pick this point there and you'll get a little bit closer. You'll get pink. Uh, or you can do the exact pixel that you click on, which is hard to show from here. So red or purple. Um, and you can also pick the alpha channel, which is occasionally useful. Um, so now you can paint, you can actually paint with zero alpha, which is absolutely useless. But, you, <laughs> but if you can get it somewhere in between, you can get, um, you can paint with alpha, which is, which, is a, which is a feature which is occasionally useful. But it's a little bit tricky to set up when I can't see what I'm doing. So there's a more advanced, this is another new feature, it's a much more advanced colour picking tool. But the old colour picking tool, which people miss, uh, is still in. So you press um, control and you see the, um, mouse, the mouse image changes to a dropper. 
and you just pick up individual pixels like that. Uh, there's, a, there's a few more things I could talk about, but I've been talking for quite a while now, so are there any more questions before I, before I wind up? Freehand? Freehand No, not at the moment, no. Um, yeah, you could you could do a you, you could simulate that by creating a layer over the top and then painting the area you wanted to select and then selecting that. Um, but but there isn't a direct freehand selection tool at the moment. No. No, the redo would save the actual um, change. And if you re the undo would save the change. If you redo it, um, it will do it exactly as you did it before. Otherwise, so it's, it's saving the bitmap data that's changed, not the actual. Effect. It would, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, there is a color mode. Yeah. 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 Sorry? You'd, you'd have to you'd have to draw it again if you want to if you want to change it on that level. Any other questions? How much does the other Undoes the last it, an individual undo action undoes the last stroke. So, um, and the paint tool. So it undoes from the moment you put the paint tool down to the moment you lift it up. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make a note of those pressures. It only it, what it undoes is the change to the image. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of number undo steps, it's unlimited and. Um, apart from available memory. Uh, you can set a limit on how much memory to use. Some, on a long project to work, you could actually build up quite a stack of them. And after a while, you don't really want to undo the first couple of steps. Um, but in principle, if you set that limit to zero, so it's infinite, you could, you could start at the very beginning and redo the whole lot from scratch. Yeah. The same thing again? If you're working all day on one project, yeah. and then you start to run out of memory, you go, you get back up. And at least some of you are on the undo button. Or does it happen on the second? That happens automatically, yeah. yeah. Um, um, yeah, as, as it hits the memory, the, the last, the, it's the first input, last, the last in, first out kind of. What is it? No, it's first in, first out, yeah. So the last thing, the first thing you undid disappears and then the next one up, up through the thing. Um, there is another, another feature that's hidden in there. You can actually record macros. Um, so you can record every event that occurs. And, and in combination with ProAction scripting, that's got macro recording as well. You can end up recording the, G, the GUI um, um, actions as well. So you can see what you did. If you need to debug something and try and work out why that went wrong, you can actually set it up so that um, uh, actually every single thing action that happens, or very nearly every single action that happens, can be redone. Or you can, or you can simply use it to create macros. If you draw a shape, um, then you can save the file, create an arrow script from that file to be able to, be able to redraw that shape on demand. And the macros can be either they really either create macro, Arix macros or Python macros, depending on the settings. Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for listening. I hope that was interesting. I know it was a little bit random and technical in places, but um, this is quite a complicated thing to try and explain. Thank you.
do give me feedback, pictures or suggestions by email or just ask me on IRC what if you get into trouble, as some of you already do. Yeah. <laughs> or vector selection. Um, yeah, selection from path. I can't remember if I've done that or not, but that is on the to-do list because that's relatively easy to do. Selection from path is easy, it's path from selection which is hard. <laughs> Seems the same. Yeah, but selection from path is a matter of creating uh, an image, a, a, a fill, and converting that into the selection. Bit by, um, but selection, path from selection, you have to work, work out where the outline